Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the Indian Evidence Act and in this lecture we will look at the further provisions of the Indian Evidence Act. So, part 3 of the Indian Evidence Act deals with production and effect of evidence. How do you produce evidence in the court and what is the effect of producing the evidence in the court? Now, in this context chapter 7 deals with of the burden of proof. So, burden of proof means who has to prove the evidence, which party has to prove the evidence. Now, here section 101 says burden of proof, whoever desires any court to give judgment as to any legal right or legal liability dependent on the existence of facts which he asserts must prove that those facts exist. When a person is bound to prove the existence of any fact it is said that the burden of proof lies on that person. So, it is defining the burden of proof. When a person is bound to prove the existence of any fact, it is said that the burden of proof lies on that person. So, this is the definition of the burden of proof. So, if you have the burden of proof, it is your foundation to prove the existence of any particular fact. And who gets the burden of proof? Any person who desires the court to give judgment as to any legal right or liability. So, the person who is desirous of the court's judgment has the burden of proof. Because if that legal right or liability is dependent on the existence of facts which he is asserting, then he only has to prove the existence of those facts which he is asserting. So, illustration A desires a court to give judgment that B shall be punished for a crime which A says B has committed. So, who is having the desire? A is having the desire. What is the fact that he is asserting? The fact is that B has committed a crime. So, A desires and this is the fact. So, A has to prove this. So, A must prove that B has committed the crime. Then A desires a court to give a judgment that he is entitled to certain land in the possession of B by reason of fact which he asserts and which B denies to be true. So, in this case as well, A has the desire and the fact is that uh, he has uh, entitlement to the land. So, in this case as well, because A is desiring, so A must prove the fact that he is entitled to the land. A must prove the existence of those facts. So, this is the burden of proof. Now, 102 says on whom the burden of proof lies. The burden of proof in a suit or proceeding lies on that person who would fail if no evidence at all were given on either side. That is, if nothing was done by the court, if the court did not intervene, if the court did not give any judgment, then the matter would be of the benefit to some person, one of the two parties. So, the party who will not be getting this benefit has the burden of proof. So, if in a, um, in, uh, in a case, for example, if the property is with B and B and A is asserting that this property should belong to me because of such and such facts. Now, if the court did not intervene, B already has the property. So, A requires the intervention of the court and if there was no intervention, B would benefit. So, in this case, A will have the burden of proof. This is what this section is saying. The burden of proof in a suit or proceeding lies on that person who would fail if no evidence at all were given on either side. For example, A sues B for land of which B is in possession and which as A asserts was left to A by the will of C, B's father. So, if no evidence were given on either side, B would be entitled to retain his position. So, in this case, the status quo without any intervention of the court is that B would 
remain entitled to his possession and so the burden of proof will go to the other party which is A in this case. Then section 103 says burden of proof as to a particular fact. The burden of proof as to any particular fact lies on that person who wishes the court to believe in its existence unless it is provided by any law that the proof of that fact shall lie on any particular person. So, for any particular fact about which there is no provision that any particular person has to prove it. So, in that case the burden of proof will lie on that person who wishes the court to believe in its existence. So, in this case as well the person who wants or who has the desire that the court should believe in this particular fact has the burden of proof. So, he has to prove before the court that the uh, that such and such facts exist is what this section 103 is saying. For example, A prosecutes B for theft and wishes the court to believe that B admitted the theft of C. So, in this case A is doing prosecution and A is saying that B has done a theft to C. So, in this case this is a fact and A wants that court should believe in this fact and so A must prove the admission. A must prove this fact that B admitted the thing. Then section 104 says burden of proving fact to be proved to make evidence admissible. The burden of proof or uh, the burden of proving any fact necessary to be proved in order to enable any person to give evidence of any other fact is on the person who wishes to give such evidence. Meaning that in certain cases you need to prove a fact before making an evidence admissible. For example, A wishes to prove a dying declaration by B. Now, uh, in the law dying declaration is a specific kind of declaration and if A is trying to prove the dying declaration of B, then a dying declaration can only be admissible if B is actually dead. So, if A is wishing to prove a dying declaration, he must also prove that B has died. Similarly, A wishes to prove by secondary evidence that contents of a lost document. Now, we saw before that in the case of documents, the court will go with primary evidence and not the secondary evidence. The court will only admit secondary evidence if the document is either lost or is uh, beyond the reach of the court or the person who has the document cannot be found and so on. Now, in this case, A is wishing to prove the contents of a lost document and in the case of lost document, the court may admit secondary evidence, but to admit the secondary evidence regarding the document, it must be proved that the document is actually a lost document, it has been lost. So, because A is wishing to prove, so in this case A must also prove that the document has been lost, so that the, the secondary evidence is made admissible in this case. So, in all these cases what we are saying is the person who is desirous of something other than the status quo or if a person wants the intervention of a court or if a person wants the court to believe something either a fact or uh, the matter that a particular document is lost that person will have the burden of proof. So, that is regarding the burden of proof. Then section 105 says burden of proving that case of accused comes within exceptions. We saw that in the case of uh, the IPC we have certain general exceptions. Now, if the accused says that his case comes under one of these general exceptions, then that person only will have to prove. For example, A accused of murder alleges that by reason of unsoundness of mind, he did not know the nature of the act. So, unsoundness of mind is one of the general exceptions in the IPC. Now, A wants the court to believe that his case is that of uh, unsoundness of mind and so the burden of proof will lie on A. Similarly, 
A accused of murder alleges that by grave and sudden provocation, he was deprived of the power of self-control. So, here as well the burden of proof will be on A, he will have to prove that he was actually deprived of the power of self-control. Then section 106 says burden of proving fact especially within knowledge. When any fact is especially within the knowledge of any person, the burden of proving that fact is upon him. Because if there is certain fact that is within the knowledge of a particular person and nobody else. So, in that case that person only will have to prove it. For example, A is charged with travelling on, on a railway without a ticket. The burden of proving that he had a ticket is on him. Because it is a fact that is especially within the knowledge of A. He has been charged that he is travelling without ticket. Now, if he had the ticket, then where has he kept it is only within the knowledge of A. And so, the burden of proving that he had a ticket is on A only. So, if a fact is within is especially within the knowledge of a particular person, then that person only will have to prove it. Burden of proving death of a person known to have been alive within 30 years. When the question is whether a man is alive or dead and it is shown that he was alive within 30 years, the burden of proving that he is dead is on the person who affirms it. So, here as well the person who wants the court to believe that this person has died will have to prove that the person is dead if the person has been known to be alive within 30 years. Similarly, in the case of a person who has not been heard of for 7 years. So, burden of proving that person is alive who has not been heard of for 7 years. So, for the past 7 years nobody knows where this person is. He has not been heard of. So, in that case the person who is saying that this person is alive will have to prove it. Provided that when the question is whether a man is alive or dead and it is proved that he has not been heard of for 7 years by those who would naturally have heard of him if he had been alive, the burden of proving that he is alive is shifted to the person who affirms it. So, here as well the person who wants the court to believe that this person is alive will have to prove that he is alive. Burden of proof as to relationship in case of partners, landlord and tenant, principal and agent. When the question is whether persons are partners, landlord and tenant or principal and agent and it has been shown that they have been acting as such. The burden of proving that they do not stand or have ceased to stand to each other in those relationships respectively is on the person who affirms it. So, here as well the status quo is that everybody believes that these people are partners or they are landlord and tenant or they are principal and agent basically a master servant relationship. So, if they have been be behaving in this way and everybody thinks or any rational person thinks that they are in this relationship. And if somebody is saying that no, we are not in this relationship anymore. So, the person who states that or the person who affirms that will have to prove that they are no, no longer in this relationship. So, here as well if you want to change the state the status quo, the person who is desirous of changing the status quo or wanting the court to believe something will have to prove the fact. Burden of proof as to ownership. When the question is whether any person is owner of anything of which he is shown to be in possession, the burden of proving that he is not the owner is on the person who affirms that he is not the owner. So, when a person is owning something, he is in the possession of something, somebody is, is in possession of a house and if another person says that this person is not the owner. So, here as well if the court did not intervene what would happen? The person would continue to remain in the position of that house. So, that is the status quo if nothing was done. 
to the person who wants to change the status quo or the person who wants to believe uh, who wants to make the court believe that this person is not in uh, not an owner of this house will have to prove it so the person who affirms that the person who is in possession of something is not the owner will have to prove it then proof of good faith in transactions where one party is in relation of active confidence so when we talk about good faith in transactions where there is a question as to the good faith of a transaction between parties one of whom stands to the other in a position of active confidence the burden of proving the good faith of the transaction is on the party who is in a position of active confidence so for example the good faith of a sale by a client to an attorney is in question in a suit brought by the client so basically what is happening here is that there is a client and an attorney and the client has sold something to the attorney in good faith now the client is saying that i was duped this attorney did not act in good faith so the burden of proving the good faith of the transaction is on the attorney because the client is saying that the attorney did not act in good faith so because the attorney was in the position of active confidence so the attorney will have to prove that he actually worked in good faith similarly the good faith of a sale by a son just come of age to a father is in question in a suit brought by the son so what has happened here is that a son who was so far minor has just become major and he has sold his property to his father in good faith and the father is uh, or uh, is not acting as he should and the son is saying that my father is not working in good faith he is working against my interests so the burden of proving the good faith of the transaction is on the father because the father is in a position of active confidence here then presumption as to certain offenses section 111a where a person is accused of having committed any offense specified in subsection 2 so what are these offenses it is these offenses an offense under section 121 121a 122 or 123 of the ipc criminal conspiracy or attempt to commit or abetment of an offense under section 122 or 123 of the ipc so we have seen before in the case of ipc that these are very grave offenses now where a person is accused of having committed any offense specified in subsection 2 in an area declared to be a disturbed area under any enactment for the time being in force making provision for the suppression of disorder and restoration and maintenance of public order or an area in which there has been over a period of more than one month extensive disturbance of the public peace so basically there is uh, a lack of public peace there is a lack of tranquility in an area or it has been declared as such and there is uh, a case that a person has been involved in disturbing the, that area and it is shown that the person had been at a place in such area at a time where when firearms or explosives were used at or from that place to attack or resist the members of any armed forces all the forces charged with the maintenance of public order acting in the discharge of their duties so what is happening here is that in a disturbed area there was a person and he was present at a time when firearms or explosives were used against the authorities so in that case it shall be presumed until the contrary is shown that such person has committed such offense so it is presumed and it shall be presumed it must be presumed it has to be presumed that that person who was in the disturbed area at a time when firearms or explosives were being used to attack or resist the authority then it must be presumed that that person was involved in this offense and the contrary has to be proved by that person so he'll have to show that no i was not involved in this offense now why was this provision made because we have seen that 
nearly everywhere we have the presumption of innocent until proven guilty. But in a disturbed area, you might not be having sufficient number of evidences, sufficient number of eyewitnesses. And so, only in the case of disturbed areas, this provision applies. And so, the burden of proof will lie on the person who has been accused of these offences. Now, section 112 says, birth during marriage, conclusive proof of legitimacy. The fact that any person was born during the continuance of a valid marriage between his mother and any man, or within 280 days after its dissolution, the mother remaining unmarried shall be conclusive proof that he is the legitimate son of that man. Unless it can be shown that the parties to the marriage had no access to each other at any time when he could have been begotten. So, what it is saying here is that it is saying that it is a conclusive proof. It does not have to be proved again. If a person was born during the marriage of his mother with a person or within 280 days after the dissolution of the marriage and the mother has remained unmarried. So, in that case, it will be a conclusive proof that the person that was born is a legitimate child of the mother and the person to whom she was married. Then section 113a says presumption as to abetment of suicide by a married woman. When the question is whether the commission of suicide by a woman had been abetted by her husband or any relative of her husband and it is shown that she had committed suicide within a period of 7 years from the date of her marriage and that her husband or such relative of her husband had subjected her to cruelty, the court may presume. Now, here it is may presume, not shall presume. The court may presume having regard to all other circumstances of the case that such suicide had been abetted by her husband or by such relative of her husband. So, it is talking about suicide by a married woman within 7 years of her marriage. So, in that case, the court may presume considering the circumstances of the uh, case that the suicide had been abetted by her husband or by a relative of her husband if she had been subjected to cruelty. And for the purposes of this section, cruelty shall have the same meaning as in section 498A of the IPC. Then section 113B says presumption as to dowry death. Now, this A and B means that these were added later on. So, presumption as to dowry death, when the question is whether a person has committed the dowry death of a woman. And it is shown that soon before her death, such woman had been subjected by such person to cruelty or harassment for or in connection with any demand for dowry. The court shall presume, in this case, the court has to presume that such person had caused the dowry death. And here again, uh, for the purposes of this section, dowry death shall have the same meaning as in section 304b of the IPC. So, these were provisions added later on to make uh, the punishment uh, in case of uh, suicide and uh, dowry death of married women harsher. Then section 114 says, court may presume existence of certain facts. The court may presume the existence of any fact which it thinks likely to have happened, regard being had to the common course of natural events, human conduct and public and private business in relation to the facts of that particular case. So, the court may presume the existence of any fact which it thinks likely and here it is may presume. So, for example, the court may presume that a man who is in possession of stolen goods soon after the theft is either the thief or has received the goods knowing them to be stolen unless he can account for his possession. So, this is a very important section because the court may presume the existence of any fact which it thinks likely. If a man is, is in possession of stolen goods soon after the theft, so the court may consider that it is highly likely that this person who is in possession of stolen goods is either the thief 
or he is dealing with stolen goods. So, he has received the, the goods knowing them to be stolen unless he can account for his position. Now, in this case, so we have all these different examples, but the court shall also re have regard to such facts as the following in considering whether such maxims do or do not apply to the particular case before it. So, the court may presume, but it also has to consider the other uh, options that are possible. So, for example, a shopkeeper has in his bill a marked rupee soon after it was stolen. So, in this case, there is a shopkeeper who is in possession of a stolen property because it is a marked note and soon after it was stolen, but he cannot account for its, for its possession specifically, but is continually receiving rupees in the course of his business. So, in this case, the court will not presume that this shopkeeper is the thief because he has the stolen good, the marked rupee or he has taken it knowing it to be a stolen good because it is in the normal course of his business that he has been receiving money continuously. He has been continuously receiving rupees in the course of his business. So, it is quite possible that he may not be able to account for his position of this marked rupee. So, with these caveats, the court may presume certain things that it considers highly likely. Then section 114a states that presumption as to absence of consent in, uh, in certain prosecution for rape. So, in prosecution for rape under these clauses of section 376 of the IPC, where sexual intercourse by the accused is proved. And the question is whether it was without the consent of the woman alleged to have been raped and such woman states in her evidence before the court that she did not consent. The court shall presume that she did not consent. So, in the matters of rape, if it is proved that the sexual intercourse has happened and the woman says that she did not give consent, so in that case the court shall presume that she did not give consent. Then chapter 8 deals with estoppel and we have seen before the meaning of estoppel. So, when one person has by his declaration, act or omission, the person has either declared something or he has acted in certain way or through omission, he has intentionally caused. Now, here the word intentionally is very important because there must be an intention of uh, making someone else believe about the, these things intentionally caused or permitted other person to believe to be true and to act upon such belief. Neither he nor his representative shall be allowed in any suit or proceeding between himself and such person or his representative to deny the truth of that thing. Meaning that if you have said something once, you cannot uh, go against that later on. For example, A intentionally and falsely leads B to believe that certain land belongs to A and thereby induces B to buy and pay for it. So, what has happened here? It has so happened that there is a land that does not belong to A, but A has led B to believe that this land belongs to him and then he has induced B to buy and pay for it. So, he has taken money and then he has sold this land which did not belong to him and the land afterwards becomes the property of A and A seeks to set aside the sale on the ground that at the time of the sale he had no title. So, in this case he must not be allowed to prove his want of title because he himself is, allow, uh, is involved and he has fraudulently led B to believe that this land was belonging to A. And after this belief, he has already sold this land to B. So, later on when he comes into possession of this land, he cannot deny it. And these cases come very often when it comes to the inheritance of land. So, if somebody is selling a land that currently does not belong to him, but belongs to his father and after he has sold this land, he gets this land from his father because the father dies. So, because he has already sold this land once, he must not be allowed to prove that at the time of the sale, this land did not belong to him, it was belonging to his father and so he had no right to sell it. 
so this is the meaning of estoppel then chapter 9 deals with of witnesses who may testify all persons shall be competent to testify unless the court considers that they are prevented from understanding the questions put to them or from giving rational answers to those questions by tender years extreme old age disease whether of body or mind or any other cause of the same kind so basically any person who can understand questions and can provide rational answers to those questions is competent to testify explanation a lunatic is not incompetent to testify unless he is prevented by his lunacy from understanding the questions to put to him and giving rational answers to them so any person who can understand questions and provide rational answers is competent to testify you cannot say that he cannot testify because he suffered from x y z things then witness unable to communicate verbally a witness who is unable to speak may give his evidence in any other matter in which he can make it intelligible as by writing or by signs but such writing must be written and the signs made in open court evidence so given shall be deemed to be oral evidence so if a person is not able to speak then he may give the answers in writing or by signs the only provision being that this writing must be written and the signs should be made in open court so that everybody can see that it is this person only who has written or has made these signs and what has he written and what has he uh, made signs about provided that if the witness is unable to communicate verbally the court shall take the assistance of an interpreter or a special educator in recording the statement and such a statement shall be videographed so even if a person is unable to speak then to the person can give oral evidence then parties to civil suit and their wives or husbands husband or wife of person under criminal trial in all civil proceedings the parties to the suit and the husband or wife of any party to the suit shall be competent witnesses so if there is a civil proceeding the parties to the suit are competent witnesses and their husbands and wives are also competent witnesses in criminal proceedings against any person the husband or wife of such person respectively shall be a competent witness so if there is a criminal proceeding against somebody then the husband or wife are competent witnesses to uh, give evidence in that case now 121 says evidence of judges and magistrates no judge or magistrate shall except upon the special order of some court to which he is subordinate be compelled to answer any questions as to his own conduct in court as such judge or magistrate or as to anything which came to his knowledge in court as such judge or magistrate but he may be examined as to other matters which occurred in his presence while he was so acting so judges and magistrates will not be compelled to answer any questions about their own conduct or about anything that came into their knowledge as a judge or magistrate but they can be examined on other matters and even in these uh, points where they are not compelled to answer they can be compelled to answer upon the special order of a superior court to which they are subordinate illustrations a on his trial before the court of session says that a deposition was improperly taken by b the magistrate so a is saying that his deposition was not taken properly so the magistrate cannot be compelled to answer questions as to this except upon the special order of a superior court then a is accused before a court of session of having given false evidence to b the magistrate b cannot be asked what a said except upon the special order of a superior court so in this case this knowledge came to b because of his working as a judge so he cannot be asked what a said except upon the special order of a superior court then a is accused before the court of session of attempting to murder a police officer while on his trial before b 
so there was a trial going on and the sessions judge was sitting and in front of the sessions judge the the person a tried to murder a police officer now in this case b may be examined as to what occurred because it does not come under these two exceptions the judge cannot be compelled to answer any questions as to his own conduct that is whether or not he took the deposition properly or not he cannot be asked uh, about anything that came to his knowledge in the court as a judge or magistrate for example what did somebody say in the court but in any other matters he may be examined so for example if something happened in front of him he may be examined for that then section 122 communications during marriage now this is a very important section no person who is or has been married shall be compelled to disclose any communication made to him during marriage by any person to whom he or has been married nor shall he be permitted to disclose any information unless the person who made it or his representative in interest consents except in suits between married persons or proceedings in which one married person is prosecuted for any crime committed against the other meaning that the law considers that marriage is a very special relationship it's a very sacred relationship and the husband or wife should not be compelled to disclose any communication made to uh, them by each other or to uh, disclose any such communication unless the other party consents so if the husband has told wife something the wife will not be made uh, to uh, to tell the court what the husband said nor will she be permitted to disclose so even if she wants to she will not be permitted to disclose that information till the husband consents the only exception being that if this is a suit between the married persons so if the husband and wife are on opposite sides then they are permitted to speak against each other or to, to disclose this information or proceedings in which one married person is prosecuted for any crime committed against the other so only in those cases are communications during marriage allowed to be disclosed otherwise it's not even allowed to be disclosed then evidence as to affairs of state no one shall be permitted to give any evidence derived from unpublished official records relating to any affairs of the state except with the permission of the officer at the head of the department concerned who shall give or withhold such permission as he thinks fit so when we are talking about the affairs of the state or the government then any unpublished official records can only be uh, given evidence of with the permission of the head of the department concerned not otherwise official communications no public officer shall be compelled to disclose communications made to him in official confidence when he considers that the public interest would suffer by the disclosure so in a large number of cases there are protections given to uh, people now information as to commission of offences no magistrate or police officer shall be compelled to say whence that is from where he got any information as to the commission of any offence and no revenue officer shall be compelled to say whence he got any information as to the commission of any offence against the public revenue meaning that you are not compelled to disclose your uh, your uh, sources so no magistrate or police officer and no revenue officer will be compelled to disclose where he got the information from who is the source of the information then section 126 says professional communications no barrister attorney pleader or vakil shall at any time be permitted unless with his client's express consent to disclose any communication made to him in the course and for the purpose of his employment as such barrister pleader attorney or vakil so there is an attorney client communication and this has to be uh, uh, saved from disclosure so he is not permitted without the client's express consent to disclose what went on between both of them what they said or to state the contents or condition of any document 
with which he has become acquainted in the course and for the purpose of his professional employment. So, if the client has shown any document to his vakil, then the content or the condition of that document also is not permitted to be disclosed without the client's consent or to disclose any advice given by him to his client in the course and for the purpose of his employment. So, this is a privileged information provided that nothing in this section shall protect from disclosure any such communication made in the furtherance of any illegal purpose. So, if the client is saying that I will be doing such Ill illegal things, then that can be disclosed. And any fact observed by any barrister, pleader, attorney or vakil in the course of his employment as such showing that any crime or fraud has been committed since the commencement of his employment. So, after he was employed, if some crime or fraud has been committed, then the person is uh, allowed to disclose that information. It is immaterial whether the attention of such barrister, pleader, attorney or vakil was or was not directed to such fact by or on behalf of his client. And the obligation stated in this section continues after the employment has ceased. So, even after they are no longer in attorney-client relationship, then to the obligation to keep these things secret, it continues. For example, A, a client says to B, an attorney, I have committed forgery and I wish you to defend me. As the defense of a man known to be guilty is not a criminal purpose, this communication is protected from disclosure. So, if you tell your attorney or your vakil that you have committed a crime and you are asking him to defend you. So, because defense of a man known to be guilty is not a criminal purpose, so this communication is protected from disclosure. The attorney cannot tell it to the court that you have uh, committed the crime and you have told him that. It is a privileged information. A, a client says to be an attorney, I wish to obtain possession of property by use of a forced deed on which I request you to sue. Now, this communication being made in furtherance of a, of a criminal purpose is not protected from disclosure because what has happened here is that this is a criminal purpose that has come to the knowledge of the attorney and this crime has not yet been committed. So, it is not protected from disclosure. And A being charged with embezzlement retains B an attorney to defend him. In the course of the proceedings, B observes that an entry has been made in A's account book charging A with the sum said to have been embezzled, which entry was not in the book at the commencement of his employment. So, here it has come to the knowledge of the attorney that something has been changed in the document after he got employed. So, this fact being a fact observed by B in the course of his employment showing that a fraud has been committed since the commencement of the proceedings is not protected from disclosure. So, he can disclose this to the court. Then 127 says section 126 to apply to interpreters etc. So, all the interpreters, clerks and servants of the attorney, barrister, pleader or vakil, they also have to follow all the provisions given in the previous section. So, anything that comes to their knowledge is also privileged information. They are not allowed to disclose it. Then section 129 says confidential communications with legal advisors. No one shall be compelled to disclose to the court any confidential communication which has taken place between him and his legal professional advisor, unless he offers himself as a witness, in which case he may be compelled to disclose any such communications as may appear to the court necessary to be known in order to explain ev any evidence which he has given, but no others. So, any confidential communication with the legal advisor is not to be disclosed unless the person has become a witness and he requires to tell these for, uh, ma for uh, making the court understand about any evidence which he has given, but not for any other matters. Then section 131 says production of documents or electronic records which another person having position could refuse to produce. So, no one shall be compelled to produce documents in his position or electronic records under his control which any other person would be entitled to refuse or uh, to produce if they were in his position or control 
unless such last mentioned person consents to their production. So, if somebody else could refuse to produce, then you cannot be compelled to produce the documents or the records. Then 132 says, witness not excused from answering on the ground that the answer will criminate. So, even if the witness knows that the answer is going to incriminate him, he is not excused from answering on this ground. A witness shall not be excused from answering any question as to any matter relevant to the matter in issue in any suit or in any civil or criminal proceeding upon the ground that the answer to such question will criminate or may di tend directly or indirectly to criminate such witness or that it will expose or tend directly or indirectly to expose such witness to a penalty or forfeiture of any kind. Provided that no such answer which a witness shall be compelled to give shall subject him to any arrest or prosecution or be proved against him in any criminal proceeding except a prosecution for giving false evidence by such answer. Meaning that if you have given an answer in the court that is incriminating you, that is uh, that you that you are accepting that you have done something wrong. So, this does not excuse you from answering, You'll, you will have to answer even if a question incriminates you. Provided that this answer will not subject you to any arrest or prosecution and this will not be proved against you in any criminal proceeding. So, if somebody has to bring up this matter in the court that you have done this thing wrong, they will have to independently prove it. They cannot use this statement against you except a prosecution for giving false evidence by such answer. So, this is the saving provision that is given. Accomplice, uh, an accomplice shall be a competent witness against an accused person and a conviction is not illegal merely because it proceeds upon the uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice. So, an accomplice is also a competent witness. Number of witnesses, there is no particular number. So, no particular number of witnesses shall in any case be required for the proof of any fact. So, even a single witness may be enough and there can also be cases where 100 witnesses are not enough. So, there is no particular number. Then chapter 10 says of the examination of witnesses. How are the witnesses examined in the books? So, order of production of uh, and examination of witnesses, the order in which witnesses are produced and examined shall be regulated by the law and the practice for the time being relating to civil and criminal procedure respectively and in the absence of any such law by the discretion of the court. So, the order of production and examination of witnesses can be governed by law or it can be governed by the discretion of the court. Judge to decide as to the admissibility of evidence. When either party proposes to give evidence of any fact, the judge may ask the party proposing to give evidence in what matter the alleged fact if proved will be relevant. And the judge shall admit the evidence if he thinks that the fact if proved would be relevant and not otherwise. So, if somebody is giving an evidence of a fact to the court, then the judge may ask that person about how if this fact is proved, how would it be relevant to the court, uh, to the case. And this shall only be admitted as evidence if it is a relevant fact and not otherwise. If the fact proposed to be proved is one of which evidence is admissible only upon the proof of some other fact, such last mentioned fact must be proved before evidence is given of the fact first mentioned. Unless the party undertakes to give proof of such fact, and the court is satisfied with such undertaking. For example, it is proposed to prove a fact about a relevant fact by a person alleged to be dead, which statement is relevant under section 32. So, the fact that the person is dead must be proved by the person proposing to prove the statement before evidence is given of the statement. So, if there is a statement by a dead person and a person is trying to prove that this statement was given by the dead person. 
and in that case it must be proved before giving this statement that the person actually is dead. It is proposed to prove by a copy the contents of a document said to be lost. So we are trying to give a secondary evidence because it's a lost document. So in this case the fact that the original is lost must be proved by the person proposing to produce the copy before the copy is produced. So it must be proved beforehand. Then there are three kinds of examinations. The first is known as examination in chief. The examination of witness by the party who calls him shall be called his examination in chief. So there are two parties to the case and suppose the first party has brought in a witness. So the party who has brought the witness is allowed to examine the witness, ask him questions. And this is known as the examination in chief. Once the party who has brought the witness has asked the questions, now it will be the turn of the other party, which will be known as the cross-examination of the witness. And based on the answers given in the cross-examination, the first party can then again ask questions to, to the witness, which is known as the re-examination of the witness. So these are three different kinds of examinations. The first one is examination of the witness by the party who calls him, which is known as the examination in chief. Then cross-examination is done by the adverse party and re-examination is done by uh, after the cross-examination by the party who called the person. Now order of examination, we have seen that first of all is the examination in chief, then cross-examination, then re-examination. Now cross-examination of person called to produce a document. A person summoned to produce a document does not become a witness by the mere fact that he produces it. So if somebody has brought a document, it does not automatically mean that that person becomes a witness. He cannot be cross-examined unless and until he is called as a witness. Now witnesses to character, witnesses to character may be cross-examined and re-examined. Then we have leading questions. What are leading questions? Any question suggesting the answer which the person putting it wishes or expects to receive is called a leading question. So for example, a question that is asking that isn't it true that this person murdered this person? So you have already given the answer in the question. You are already leading the witness towards a certain answer. And this sort of a question is known as a leading question where you are leading the witness to a particular answer. So any question suggesting the answer which the person putting it wishes to expect, wishes or expects to receive is called a leading question. Now leading questions must not if objected to by the adverse party be asked in an examination in chief or in a re-examination except with the permission of the court. So the party that has brought the witness is not allowed to ask leading questions if it is objected to by the adverse party except with the permission of the court. So only the court can allow this otherwise the other party can object. However, leading questions may be asked in cross-examination because the party who has brought the witness may have had previous discussions and so they are not allowed to ask leading questions but the adverse party can ask those questions. Evidence as to matters in writing, any witness may be asked while under examination whether any contract, grant or other disposition of property as to which he is giving evidence was not contained in a document and if he says that it was or if he is about to make any statement as to the contents of any document which in the opinion of the court ought to be produced, the adverse party may object to such evidence being given until such document is produced or until facts have been proved which entitle the party uh, who called the witness to give secondary evidence to it. So we have seen before that in the case of documents, the court is going to go with the primary evidence. So in this case, if you have called a witness and if you are asking him about the document orally, then the other party can object to it. Then cross-examination as to previous statements in writing. A witness may be cross-examined as to previous statements made by him in writing or reduced to, into writing and relevant to the matters in question without such writing being shown to him or being proved 
but if it is intended to contradict him by the writing, his attention must, before the writing can be proved, be called to those parts of it which are used for the purpose of contradicting him. So, this is uh, for matters that have been reduced to writing. Then we have questions lawful in cross-examination. There are, are different kinds of questions that are permitted to be asked to test the veracity, to discover who he is, what is his position in life, to shake his credit and so on. Now, court to decide when questions shall be asked and when witness shall be compelled to answer. So, it is a prerogative of the court to decide when questions will be asked and when witnesses will be compelled to answer. Questions not to be asked without reasonable grounds. So, you cannot go about asking anything. There has to be a reasonable ground. So, for example, a barrister is instructed by an attorney or vakil that an important witness is a dakat. Now, this is a reasonable ground for asking the witness whether he is a dakat. So, this is a reasonable ground. But you cannot ask anybody, are you a dakat? Then procedure of court in case of question being asked without reasonable grounds. If the court is of opinion that any such question was asked without reasonable grounds, it may, if it was asked by any barrister, pleader, vakil or attorney, report the circumstances of the case to the high court or other authority to which such barrister, pleader, vakil or attorney is subject in the exercise of his profession. Indecent and scandalous questions, the court may forbid these questions if they are indecent and scandalous. Questions intended to insult or annoy, the court shall forbid. So, in this case, the court has to forbid. Question by party to his own witness, the court may in its discretion permit the person who calls a witness to put any questions to him which might be put in cross-examination by the adverse party. Nothing in this section shall disentitle the person so permitted under subsection 1 to rely on any part of the evidence of such witness. Then impeaching the credit of witness, the credit of a witness may be impeached. So, you might prove in the court that this witness does not have sufficient credit and so his statements should not be taken on the face value. Questions tending to corroborate evidence of relevant fact are admissible. So, for example, A, an accomplice gives an account of robbery in which he took part. So, A was also a part of this robbery operation. He describes various incidents unconnected with the robbery which occurred on his way to and from the place where it was committed. So, it was not directly connected, it was unconnected facts. For example, I saw this person coming or the lights of this building were on or off and th things like that, which are not directly connected with the robbery. Now, independent evidence of these facts may be given in order to corroborate his evidence as to the robbery itself. So, this is permitted. Now, former statements of witnesses may be proved to corroborate later testimony of the same fact. Refreshing memory. So, a witness may while under examination refresh his memory by referring to any writing made by himself at the time of the transaction concerning which he is questioned or so soon afterwards that the court considers it likely that the transaction was at that time fresh in his memory. So, if you are asked about something, you can look at what you have written at that time. Also, an expert may refresh his memory by reference to professional treatises. So, in, when the expert is giving his opinion, he may uh, look at the books once again to refresh his memory. Testimony to facts stated in document mentioned in uh, section 159. A witness may also testify to facts mentioned in any such document as mentioned in the previous section, though he has no specific recollection of the facts himself, if he is sure that the facts were correctly recorded in the document. So, if you do not know what was actually written in the document, you can at least tell the court that this document was made in a proper manner. Right of adverse party as to writing used to refresh memory, production of documents, using as evidence of document, production of which was refused on notice. So, if somebody has refused to produce a document, he will not be allowed to show later on that, uh, that this document is to be used as an evidence without the consent of the other party or the order of the court. 
Now judges power to put questions or order the production. Then uh, chapter 11 deals with of improper admission and rejection of evidence where it says no new trial for improper admission or rejection of evidence. So if there is improper admission of or rejection of evidence then this does not lead to a new trial. So what we have seen here is that the Indian Evidence Act looks at the procedures in which the evidences will be given. What has to be proved, what has not to be proved, how it is going to be proved. But throughout the Indian Evidence Act, we do not find any mention of uh, uh, the offenses or the penalties. So this is primarily a procedural act. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.